Thanks for listening to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. You can contact the show at twitter.com forward slash DW Groovecast and through Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. Good evening. I am warning you right now, if you touch my drums, I will stab you in the neck with a knife. Ain't a fucking. Ain't a fucking. Mom! Lower it. I'm not gonna lower it. I have to do this now. I don't mind playing it, but lower it. Everything is straight now? No, we had a problem. I mean, uh, we tried to do everything we could. What do you mean? Well, you know what I mean. Nice. Little trouble there. You're rushing. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Happy holidays, Groovecasters. Phil here from DWG. We trust that your holiday season is going along swimmingly. Uh, We've enjoyed being here with you for the past one and a half years. Unbelievable going on two years. This is our second holiday season. And with most holiday seasons, we have holiday traditions. And this show is going to be no different. We're going to bring to you our first installment of the best of 2017 the interviews and what we're going to basically do is go back through chronologically and highlight some of the best moments of our interviews for 2017 and in virtually every case by popular demand the drummers weekly groove cast rorschach test will be highlighted in each of them so uh, sit back relax enjoy some of our favorite moments from the interviews of 2017 And we're going to start on a tour bus with the incredible Adam Deitch. Um, He invited us out to a lettuce show back in January. And um, after sound check, we piled all into the lettuce tour bus, the fun bus. He sat down with us for about an hour and a half, and a good time was had by all. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say after getting to know Adam... He is absolutely going to require everyone to grab their favorite cup of hard eggnog to enjoy this. So let's sit back and listen to Adam Deitch. With your parents also, of course, like we've just mentioned, being drummers and being professional drummers, did you ever feel any kind of either pressure from them to excel and or did you subconsciously or even consciously put pressure on yourself mm-hmm. knowing that? Yeah, yeah, there was a little bit of pressure. You know, uh, my mom was a consummate professional and she was a drummer and my dad was a keyboard player and they had a duo. And so, you know, I, I had to... When they when I, when I sat in on gigs when I was five six seven years old, it, it, my mom kind of was was you know she was happy that I was doing it, but it was definitely like be professional and play the beat and play the song and you know so it was kind of you know she would give me a look sometimes if I get off you know so I, I basically I learned on on their gigs and, and you know there was just a little bit of pressure fun pressure not like a. I know kids that have classical, you know, people that I, that I grew up with classical parents and they would have to play recitals and, and they can't mess up one note. It wasn't that kind of pressure. It was like, they're very loving, amazing people. So uh, just uh, the pressure to succeed and the pressure to, uh, you know, w- where they became parents and, and kind of gave up traveling and becoming professional musicians as far as traveling or in a band. They kind of worked locally. And my job was sort of to, uh, I guess, maybe spread the family name out a little bit, you know, and uh, let people know that the Deitches are a drum family, you know, and and, uh, and uh, we got a lot we got a lot of drums for, for the world. <laughs> yeah, and so cool. so the, the cool thing that I kind of got out of that is it was not necessarily anxiety inducing mm. sort of pressure. Nah, you know? I mean, I've you know, <laughs> very minuscule anxiety, but mostly it was it was uh, love and, and fun. Yeah. Just little short questions. I don't want you to overthink these, man. It's going to be literally like I'm going to go, hey, Coke or Pepsi, and you would go, whatever. It's a little short yeah. questions, all right? Yeah, Mountain Dew. Yeah, so you okay. can tell it's going to be serious. I'm putting on my glasses, <laughs> man, so I can see these. All right. John, start the clock. 
Nah. All right, here we go. <laughs> Wood tip or nylon tip? Wood tip. In ears or wedges? In ears. Jets or giants? Giants. Clyde or Jabbo? Clyde. Clyde. Jabbo. Clyde. Jabbo. Clyde. Pat Boone, Debbie Boone, or Face Melter? Pat Boone, Debbie Boone. <laughs> What's your favorite TV show? <laughs> Favorite TV, uh, TV show. Um, um, I really like Quantico right now. Right on. It's about CIA life. Remember, I said we we're going to call back something. Long Island Drum Center or Manhattan Drum Shop. Uh, I'm Long Island Drum Center in Nyack all day. Yeah. Got hard cases or bags. Uh, hard cases for tour, bags for home. Got it. <laughs> Barbecue, pork or beef. Man, I'm gonna go with. I had some beef brisket yesterday. It was incredible. Oh. Beef. Elvin or Tony? What's that? Elvin or Tony? Woo wee! That's fair, man. I didn't come up with these, by the way. Don't man. think. Don't think too much, okay, man. I'm just gonna go t- Tony, man. He, he played funk records later on his life. PC or Mac? I'm Mac all day. When you're in Manhattan, drive or cab? I don't even have a license, man. <laughs> That's gonna be cab. <laughs> Motown or Stax? I do have a skateboard, though. Uh, um, Stax. Up at dawn or up at the crack of noon? Um, asleep at dawn, up at the crack of noon. No. <laughs> Definitely crack of noon. Metal snare, wood snare? Um, oof. Uh, 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 go wood. Go wood. You just got your dream gig who's the first person you call mom dad <laughs> both of them yes. vintage gear or new gear new gear with a vintage aesthetic coffee or tea I've been on some coffee recently Brady White with Earth, Wind, and Fire, or Freddie White with Donny Hathaway? That is an excellent question. <laughs> and I'm going yes. go, to go Earth, Wind, and Fire because I know everything he ever played it on. Earth and, Fire. Okay, go ahead. and the money question. Jason Lee or Ray Barbie? Wow. <laughs> that, how, you, you did your research. Man, they're not going to come after you, man. Just no, man. I had a Jason Lee board. I, I'm going to go Jason Lee. And he became an actor. So, you know, who knows? But Many I love Ray Barbie. Ray Barbie had that only. street style, you know, like, ooh. Awesome. You guys are great. There you have it, guys. <laughs> Adam Deitch, man, from Lettuce. How about that? Adam Deitch. Awesome. We had a great time with uh, the Lettuce Boys on the tour bus. Um, they're coming around soon again to your neck of the woods. Seems like they are constantly touring. Do yourself a favor and go out and see them. What a great band. And if you get a chance to say hello to them, make sure you do it. Tell them that, uh, tell Adam you're listening to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast and enjoyed his show. All right, onward we go. We move a few weeks further into 2017, and John and I were presented with a unique opportunity to speak with Mr. Joel Rosenblatt, and aside from that being a unique opportunity, it was our first stab at doing a Skype interview, and it turned out rather well. So uh, let's go ahead and listen to a few things that Mr. Rosenblatt had to say on our first Skype interview. Suntan record, like I said, was was on hot rotation at the school where I was where I was in school. We used to listen to it yeah. all the time, talk about it. Now I've got questions about when you were working with Michelle Camilo as far as like how you guys did things. Yeah. Was was Michelle a guy that would hand out charts to you guys and say, We're gonna just rehearse the crap out of this stuff? Or was it a lot more by feel? And then the other the part two to this question is this. When you guys recorded those those tracks, was that something that you would play a lot live first and then really flesh that stuff out and then go in and record it? Or would it be the opposite? Would you guys record stuff first and then flesh it out on the bandstand? Um, 
Is is the Suntan record that had We Three? Is that the one that has Caribe on it also? I uh, mean, it's got Tombo and Seven Four. I know it's yeah, got that on there. Cool. I'm mm. on two songs, but I think it's that's. Yeah. All right. So I'll tell you. First of all, that record was recorded stereo to two track live. Okay. And I will tell you also for you guys, if you can picture this, uh, it was a double session. We did the whole thing in one day. Weckl did his tunes, and then I did my tunes. I think I played three songs on that. Um, so Dave went first, and then Dave goes back to the control room to listen while I'm playing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right. So just put your. I was like, this is not good. <laughs> mm. Live the two track. Um, that's how that went down. Very stressful. I remember. Now regarding the chart, I can't remember if we played. You know, talking about we three and man, had we, we? It's very possible we had played it live a little bit, but not a lot. Not a lot. Uh, we might have rehearsed it. A few, I, I really can't remember. Um, but there was no overdubbing. There's no nothing. And then the other thing that, that I, that, um, you know, I think we did three or four, three takes maybe. And like I said, Weckl was in there, but Michelle, it was again, a live the two tracks. So he would, would take the take that had his best solo, mm -hmm. which obviously makes sense. But I remember Weckl telling me afterward, he said like, there's, there was another take where I was Really, he he said I sounded great on, but they didn't use that one because Michelle might have, you know, blow. And, you know, that's what happens. But um, who knows where that is? <laughs> mm. But the, the fact that Weckl was there was totally freaking me out, even though he was my bud and everything. And he was never he was just great. I mean, he you know, he is who he is. What are you going to do? It was really me putting it on me because, you know, Dave, he hears everything. You know, he hears everything. So, you know, you're playing and you go like, oh, I did that. And you go like, and then, and you know, Dave, I know Dave heard that. <laughs> uh, that's trauma. I'm reliving that trauma now. I'm in a fetal <laughs> position just hearing the damn story. <laughs> yep. Ask him the question. All right, so here we go. You ready? Yep. Wood tip or nylon tip? Wood. Mounted floor toms or floor toms with legs? Mounted. Chick Korea, electric band or return to forever? Mm. I gotta say electric. PC or Mac? Mac. What's your favorite symbol? Uh, I, I got too many of them. Bad answer. Anyway, go on. <laughs> uh, Zildjian, a Zildjian. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Elvin or Tony? Wait, I'll go back. Okay. Favorite, the favorite ride, special dry light with three rivets, 21. Got it. Elvin or Tony? Elvin. Text or phone call? <laughs> Text. Okay. For a snare mic, SM57 or anything else? 57. When you're on tour, buses or planes? Now, definitely buses. Barbecue, pork or beef? Uh, pork, medium. Gotcha. Click track or no click track? Wow, I'm split totally on that. I love them both. We'll take it. Okay. You're, you're from Jersey. Do you believe in the legend of the Jersey Devil? I never heard of that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. There's a guy from the mm -hmm. South thinking mm -hmm. he knows it all. <laughs> Come on, man. Marimba or vibraphone? Marimba. Metal snare or wood snare? Wood. Coffee or tea? Coffee. When you read charts, do you prefer overwritten charts or underwritten charts? Over. All right. Green room catering. Do you eat the food or take money and buy real food? Eat the food. Books, fiction, or nonfiction? None. In ear monitors or wedges? Uh, in ears when they're right, but that's rare. Most important question we know your first love is trumpet. Maynard or Bill Chase? I got to go with Maynard. 
<laughs> All right. There you have it, folks. Joel Rosenblatt. All right. All right, man. Well, I I have to say Fred was right in that Joel and I are kindred spirits because many of his answers would have been mine. But more importantly, this is the least amount I've talked an hour and a half in like 25 <laughs> years. I think I have a man crush on it or something. I don't know that. I like So aside from we have already a year of firsts where we had our first show on a tour bus with Adam, and then we had our first Skype interview with Joel, we also took the show on the road and we had our first factory tour. We were invited to the Gretsch factory down in Ridgeland, South Carolina, a little over four hours from uh, the Atlanta area, and Mr. Paul Cooper rolled out the red carpet and gave us about a two-hour tour. And so we sat down with him after the tour in his office, and we asked him all the questions that we ever wanted to know about the Gretsch company and how they make the drums, sell the drums, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's listen to our interview with Paul Cooper, factory manager at the Gretsch Drum Factory. The, at the end of the day, the shell, the construction, the design is what makes the drum. Well, yeah, and, and so I, I think that's I think uh, for me the most identifiable thing about a Gretsch drum is the sound. Mm -hmm. And so I think whether it was on purpose or by accident, the fact that you know since the mid '50s the shell formula has been the same. Mm -hmm. The uh, diecast hoops, the edges, the silver sealer, all those ingredients in there really haven't changed. And uh, that's what it's been about for us. Whereas a lot of other companies, they would they would change for things going on in the marketplace or whatever. Trends, and, you know, yeah, yeah. And and Gretsch was never like that. So, you know, in the long term, it's been really a great thing for us because our sound is, it's identifiable. Mm -hmm. You hear a Gretsch drum, you can tell it's a Gretsch drum. And and I do think that a lot of people really dig that sound. I know I do. I know I do. <laughs> and and it is true. I mean. A, a Rogers kit from the 60s and a Rogers kit from the 80s, completely different animals. Right. Whereas the I, the idea of keeping, you know, staying the course is, I, I, yeah. kudos to you guys, man. Well, you know, I, I've got... Not uh, broke. I've got Gretsch drums from the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s. I've got a lot of Gretsch drums. Mm -hmm. And even though, even some of them have different materials in them, it's always amazing to me how there is an identifiable sound with all of them. And uh, I think that's really what people dig about Gretsch drums. No doubt. If somebody wanted to get a job here at Gretsch, in the factory with you, is there any particular kind of like, aside from drumming background, any kind of woodworking background or anything that you look for? Well, you know, it can be helpful, and it also can be a hindrance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah to be quite honest, you know? Yeah. Uh, if somebody has... I had a guy one time that worked in the wood shop, and he was great, and he came from... His family owned a business that made furniture. He was fantastic. I've had other people that came with woodworking experience, and it really wasn't the same kind of woodworking, you know, like a carpenter, a, a finished carpenter. Well, right. maybe that did, maybe he wasn't suited. I'm not saying that all finished carpenters wouldn't be. They might be great. But this particular dude, it just wasn't suited for him. Mm -hmm. So there's a yes and a no with that, you know. Paul, anything else you want to add to this as far as like anything that you would like to? to... Oh, wait. Oh, wait. I, I, I thought about this earlier. We were okay. talking about your employees. Uh -huh. And I, I want to make it really clear how everyone here is so amazingly nice and accommodating and i think that certainly speaks to you but that's enough to get on your nerves isn't it man it, it was <laughs> it was just we're walking through and every people are going out of their way you know to say hey how you doing or letting i just think man that just adds to the whole vibe yeah and i i, I certainly credit you for your creating that environment but man it you guys really this is this is a family thing, man. It's a, it's 
Quite is. And the most important thing about this place is the people. It's, uh, it's amazing. And, and yeah. I try to think that every day because it's absolutely true. And, yeah. they're, and they're just quality people. And, and yeah. I think that in turn is putting out quality product. If you have quality people who all yeah. see that, have a same vision, and it, it was really refreshing to, to witness that, man. I think that was really cool. If you've been listening to this show for a while, first, thank you very much. Secondly, you also know that we are based out of Atlanta. And with any major metropolitan area, and especially a metropolitan area that has an active music scene, you are going to have drumming royalty that lives in that city. And Atlanta is no exception to that. Last year, we spoke with Scott Meter and Little John Roberts, both Atlanta residents. And also, this year, we spoke with Mr. Sonny Emery. Now, this is a best of show, but if we're going to be honest about this, anybody who knows Sonny, this entire show could be Sonny's show. He's a great storyteller. So I had to think about what am I going to include for Sonny because basically the two hours that we spent with him is all a best of. So I picked a couple of clips. We'll let the chips fall where they may. Here's Sonny Emery. cameo gig Mm -hmm. for a second you were playing with those guys right while you were still at at gsu Mm -hmm. how did you end up with that gig uh one night uh, myself pat buchanan vance taylor and ronnie garrett we used to have a group called rsvp Mm -hmm. and uh there used to be an old venue here called the moonshadow saloon great room everybody used to play that room jeff lorber used to come through and play that room and uh a bunch of folks. So one night, I, we were opening. My group was opening for Kenny G, mm-hmm. RSVP, and Larry walked in, came to the show, and he heard me that night. And that's kind of how, how it happened. And then I got the call soon thereafter because he was checking out Sam too. Mm-hmm. Sam had already been kind of doing a few rehearsals with them. Yeah. And um, so that's how it happened. So I got the call and and um, and then I started doing like the weekend warrior thing with them. Right. You know. So, well, that, that worked out really well, though, man, because, I mean, you, you go back to school. Yeah, for a little while it did. Yeah. And then summer summer came around, and I was in summer school, and Larry asked me to do this tour. And I went home, and I just kind of begged my parents, please, let me do this tour. I wanted to, because initially my parents were like, no, you're in school. You're not doing it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and I was like, please let me do it. So they finally, okay, you, know, okay, you keep your grades up. You can do it, right? <laughs> Trying to study on a tour bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got girls coming in and out of that thing. You know, yeah. guys, it's just all kinds of mayhem. And I'm trying to study, and it didn't work out. You know, that quarter was a, hor- a, a horrible quarter for me. You know, yeah. uh, made a D and an F. Yeah. You know, it just just didn't work. You know, so, so but musically, I learned a lot, you yeah. know. You know, Larry wrote me like Secretariat. I was going to say, do you, do you have a good Larry Blackman the, the rumors story are to true, tell us? Right? Yeah. 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 One night, we were here. I mean, we're talking uh, yeah. a, a lot of guys we know that are monsters. Oh, yeah. And every one of them's like, oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, okay, he, he first play. of all, let me say, yeah, he can play, right. And and I respect Larry. Larry's a great musician. You know, he does what he does. And uh, so we were in, we were in Denver. This is like one of like one of the first weekends that I started hitting with him, right? So we're in Denver. Okay, now you know what the altitude is like already yeah. in Denver, right? So mm-hmm. we're we're playing and we start the show and and I'm uh I'm doing okay. I'm hanging in there, you know, and we get into like the second, third song and I just start peeing out, man. I just yeah. just I'm just and so I start asking for water just like, you know, every other minute. So Larry turns around, he sees the tech is just giving me water after water. After a while he turns around, he looks at the tech, he's like, No more water for him. God, no. No more water. No. Don't no. Don't no. And I go, Oh God. So I had to just sit suck it up, man. He's like, pay attention, stay focused. Stay focused. You need to stay focused. <laughs> hey, man, people who don't know. Oh, yeah. And, and 
I, I've done gigs in Colorado where I felt fine. Yeah. And I've yeah. done gigs in Colorado where I'm like, yeah. I was in a fight with Muhammad Ali yeah, right? for 12 rounds. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, but you know, physically, it, it. Exactly. But it, it taught me rough. a valuable lesson. It's like, you know, playing drums. That was the first time that it really dawned on me that what I do. It's just like being an athlete. I need to train for this, yeah. you know. Especially if we're going to be going into places like Denver, Colorado, where you know, you you know, the altitude is will bother you just walking around, mm -hmm. and you're doing something really strenuous, man. So, so uh, I learned a lot. You but know? there's a, there's also that you know adrenaline. We're talking about exactly. another level here. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you're and you're young, up. and you're like, yeah, I'm young. I'm hyped up. The crowd is like. You know, yeah. and, 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 and Larry's like looking at me and, uh, yeah. you know, I'm nervous. You got to figure it out. Yeah, you got to figure it out, man. So and yeah. that was a funny one, man. <laughs> no more water for his. <laughs> <laughs> Cut him off. And, uh, I was like, oh, God. I was yeah. telling Phil about when I met Larry, it was uh, he, he went on about ACDC for like oh, did 15 he? minutes. Did and he really? Kind of like, did yeah. he really? Yeah. What? what? Yeah. He, he was like, he was in that mode that mode, day. Yeah. It's so funny. But he he's just an entertaining to, guy. He used to come and stand right in front of the drums, right. And if it didn't feel right to him, he would just he'd be doing this, you know. Yeah. And and uh, until you until you locked it where he wanted it, he was gonna stand right there. He would he, he would take himself out of the choreography, you know. Tommy and other guys would be he'd come back and stand right in front of the drums, and, and until uh, it. As soon as you got it locked in the way he wanted it, he'd go back out and do his thing. But you know, he was he was a stickler, man. John, are you ready? I'm, you're asking the questions, man. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> Bother me. Starting the clock. Wood tip or nylon tip? Wood. Stacks or Motown? Both. What? In ear monitors or wedges? In ears. When you're on tour, bus or plane? Bus. PC or Mac? Mac. Barbecue, pork or beef? Both. Woo. <laughs> Elvin or Tony? Both. <laughs> Come, on. <laughs> Come on, man. We got to put you on the spot here. Come on. <laughs> Live playing, click track or nothing? Nothing. What's your favorite symbol? 20 inch rock. Snare drum, wood or metal? Sunny Emory signature wood drum. <laughs> Spoken <laughs> like a true endorser. What's your favorite TV show right now? Ooh, uh, I don't watch a whole lot of TV. Um, I would have to say uh, probably you know, Breaking Bad. It's Excellent. Not on now, Excellent yeah. choice. <laughs> Think about it. this is a thinker right here. <laughs> Double paradiddle or paradiddle diddle? Paradiddle diddle. Agreed. Mm -hmm. All right, think about this one for a second. Freddie White mm -hmm. with Earth, Wind, and Fire or with Donnie Hathaway? Freddie White with Earth, Wind, and Fire. Who's your favorite drumming showman? Oh, Cozy Cole. Excellent. No, Sonny Payne, both of them. All right. Yeah. Phone calls or text messages? Phone calls. Sonny Call Payne. me. Talk to me. Yeah. Sonny Payne. Sorry. Cobble like or Chambers? Oh, man. <laughs> both. <laughs> Dogs or cats? Dogs. Vintage gear or new gear? Vintage. Last question, money question. If you could take a lesson from anyone, living or dead, who would it be? Steve Gatt. Living. That's Sonny Emery, folks. That is awesome stuff. Yeah, man. <laughs> appreciate you, man. Yeah, man. Sonny, thank time. you, man. We really appreciate you coming out. Thanks, yeah. guys. It was a pleasure, man. It was an honor to be here. Thank you. interview is dare I say the most scenic interview that I've ever conducted uh, we're back to Skype and this time around I interviewed independent symbol smith Matt Bettis from his rural Idaho home 
Uh, for those of you not familiar with Matt, Matt makes some of the world's best symbols. And he was kind enough to Skype with me from his very chilly uh, back deck. I think it was about 35 degrees that day, but he stayed outside and had the Idaho mountains for the backdrop of this interview. So uh, let's give a listen to Mr. Matt Bettis. process when you get that when you get that blank out of the crate what's the next thing to the next thing to when you get ready to ship it off well i don't really do custom symbols anymore for people uh because it it turns out that making customers custom symbols is a lot more of trying to read somebody's mind yeah uh, than than make a symbol and so it's a lot like uh, say painting portraits you know it's good money and, and it's art, but it's, it's very restricted, uh, restrictive artistically. So the first thing I do when I get a blank out is I have an internal dialogue with myself and I say, Hey Matt, how are you feeling today? What do you want to feel? What do you feel like doing? What do you, what do you think? So, you know, some days I am just raring to go and I grab the big hammer and I just wail away uh, some days I, I'm a little more mellow and then I grab a smaller hammer and, and um, a little more easier, gentler hand, uh, hammering, which makes a, a, a politer, uh, cleaner sounding symbol. Uh, it, I just love the freedom of being able to work with the blank, especially the Turkish blanks, because uh, they are, they've got their own personality, each and every one, you know. Did it spend uh, most of its time in the back of the oven uh, yeah. instead of the front of the oven? That really, you know, stuff like that makes a huge difference on blanks. Uh, so they, they definitely each have a, their own personality. And, man, you have to work with one because you can have a plan uh, of what you want to do that day, but uh, sometimes the blank says, no, no, we're not doing that. So you have to modify midstream and say, all right, all right, I'll work with you. And uh, so it, it's fun that way to, to work with the metal. So, all right, so after I figure out what I want to do, then I, uh, I run it through the power hammer uh, one time and uh, then take it over. And, and it's just a, a matter of, of a lot of hammer strokes. And, uh, you know, you, sometimes you hear guys talk about random hammering. Um, it's not. If you, if you just randomly hammer a symbol, you are going to get a randomly shaped symbol. Mm, okay. uh, which is not good. So uh, I prefer to call it irregular hammering uh, versus, you know, a machine. Um, there's definitely a pattern there. It's a very complex pattern after you put it, lay it all down. But there's definitely a pattern there, and it's just a little ir irregular uh, versus a machine. All right, so then I get it all hammered out, uh, the body, and then I do the bell. Uh, like I said, about probably a half hour on the bell, maybe 40 minutes. Get that all hammered out. And then I've got a nice, uh, nicely profiled, nicely tensioned uh, symbol uh, still with the crust on it. And then I decide, you know, what I want to do lathing. Because uh, just like hammering, there is an almost uh, infinite, uh, infinite ways to to do your lathing. Uh, so, uh, again, I asked myself, hey, Matt, what do you think? You think of thin? You think with, like, traditional K, old K-like lathing? Or, or do you want to leave some crust on? How dry do you want it to be? What do you feel like today? And uh, then I, I asked the symbol, hey, what do you want to do today? It never actually answers me, but, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I live up in the mountains of Idaho. There's not a whole lot of people to talk to up here. So. <laughs> um, 
and so then I yeah I do the lathing and uh, and sometimes I add a little patina here and there. I used to do a lot of uh, patination work, uh, not so much anymore, but but uh, sometimes I do that. Uh, and um, at the very end, you know, I decide how much tension do I want in this symbol because uh, you, that you can affect the tension of the symbol uh, greatly with a lathe. Uh, do I want it? Do I want it loose and, and floppy? Because mm -hmm. uh, some cats like that. Or do I want it nice and tight to bring out a little more stick definition? Uh, so I do that at the very end, and then I, you know, sign each one and, and put a, a serial number on each one, and put my logo, my ink logo on the bottom, and then just a, a metal stamp logo on the top. How, and then it's done. How long is the average? Uh making process for just say like a 20 or 22 inch symbol i'd say a good two and a half to three hours work always having our finger on the pulse here at the dwg headquarters and compound we realize that our listeners have a whole host and variety of different gigs that they regularly do. And one of the ones that we know that a lot of you have are different types of church gigs. Some of them are orchestral and some of them are contemporary style church gigs that are basically just a rock band inside of a church setting. So John and I thought, you know, we know a lot of folks that are in this arena. So why don't we see if any of them might be interested in coming in and talking about primarily the administrative side of the church gig. We know that it's very different from the majority of the secular gigs that we play, and there's quite a bit of mystery enshrouded in what the normal church environment is supposed to be like. People want to know how you're supposed to act, walk, talk, play. Basically, What's it like, and what are different church leaders and administrative folks looking for? So we invited Mike O'Brien into the show. He's also a longtime listener, but he is also very well connected in the contemporary worship leader environment. So let's give a listen and see what Mike O'Brien has to tell us. Now there is a there's a distinctive that's really frustrating to me as I've hired drummers or hired outside musicians is as a church musician don't always assume that you're going into the gig that you were in the last time or that all churches are the same um, you know some play to the click verse two three four chorus two mm -hmm. three four improvise two three four. I mean it's literally all mapped out to the second. Um, your next gig might not be that. There might not be a click track. There might be a wedge. There might not be ears. There might be um, the leader might uh, want to take it, uh, you know, off the chart a, a bit. So just how can I serve? What am I walking into? Not making assumptions. Because here's here's what happens is you hear stories that, well, Bob was, Bob was hurt by that church gig or, or that leader um, hurt hurt Betty the 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 drummer and well now that's my offense well no they haven't offended you right. <laughs> they offended Betty right they offended Bob so if you hear those stories it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to carry in um, some extra protection uh, but you just want to feel things out like I said you want to ask the expectation and then serve the expectation but but coming with um, coming with your own expectation that it's going to be a bunch of cheesy music or it's going to be, you know, that will affect the way you play. That will affect the way you, your attitude is definitely in the gig. And sometimes I see that with hard guns where they expect it to be something else. And it's like, why are you treating me like that? <laughs> you know, you're, you're acting strange and I haven't given you any, any reason to do that. So I think, uh, yeah, be careful in processing some of that stuff as you look for work in that world. Regarding musicians, and especially younger musicians, that 
spend the majority of their time, if not all of their time, performing in churches, um, what do you have to say to them regarding the importance of branching out a little bit and learning other music, other secular styles? I know that there are there are some musicians that actually feel conflicted about that. I think it's impor- really important. This a few months ago, my buddy Brad was uh, was working on. I don't. You guys probably know that I. I don't even know if this is right, but the Purdy Shuffle. Oh yeah, is that a thing? Oh That's yeah, a thing. Mm-hmm. So uh, is that like a six A like? T- t- like what's the it's a halftime that you will never play in church <laughs> but you could right you could yes you could yes. here's, here's uh-huh. the idea you yeah. could and you should like so your average like six eight song you know like you could just play it right and like you could just get away with murder and that soccer mom uh who learned how to play on rock band can literally get through the church service playing that beat right mm-hmm. but As a great drummer, as a drummer that has studied the Purdy Shuffle, even if you're 22 and you don't know who that is, but now you go look and you spend three or four or five weeks or months mastering that groove, you could play that over some basic suburban white 6-8 worship song. And it... Nobody would probably even know, like, or they they would know, but they would feel it. They would know that something's different and something's better. The drummer might feel it. Other, you know, like to bring your best, even to the church situation, to bring your very best, I think is really, really important because a lot of times not much is expected of you. Earlier this year, we were afforded the opportunity to sit down with industry icon John DeChristopher, the former vice president of Zildjian Symbols. He sat down with us and told us about his time at Zildjian, some of the different things that happened while he was there, and some of the achievements and accomplishments that he had. In his old age, John has now semi-retired and has started a little venture called Viper Representation, where he represents a few up-and-coming drummers like Steve Gadd, Peter Erskine, Rick Morata, and Danny Serafin. He's also still active on the performing scene there in Boston. He's got a band called Grand Theft Auto, of which he plays regularly. So let's hear what John DeChristopher had to tell us. the folks what it's basically like to try to put a clinic together regarding because somebody people have got to get paid and i know that sometimes the uh, that clinics are put together as a joint offering between several different companies give us a kind of just a basic uh example of how that might happen that's exactly how we would always do it i mean it would be a co-op with with the drum company the stick company if it wasn't zildjian drumhead company a lot of times You'd have Sure or one of the microphone companies involved. Even um, sometimes you'd have Hudson Music or or a, a publishing company like Hal Leonard in for a hundred dollars. But you know they they a lot of things have happened. I've been gone now. I mean I I resigned four and a half years ago, and I I don't think Zildjian's done any clinic tours since I left there. But even in the last year or two that I was there, they were becoming more difficult to sort of manage in terms of of dealer interest because it was costing dealers more money to do them. And that was largely due to the manufacturers pulling back their support. So I'll I'll back up and I'll say in the glory days, you know, we would, we would basically all the companies collectively would fund it and the dealer would only have to cover the cost of maybe a hotel room for the night. So we'd come through Memphis, go to uh, Jim Pettit's place down at Memphis drum shop and Jim would put, um, Tony Williams or somebody up in a hotel for the night, I'd be, I'd be traveling on Zildjian's dime and his fee would be covered by DW, by us, by, you know, all the different companies. And when you pick the right artist, the companies are willing to, to come in and spend the money. Um, it's, it was always difficult with the smaller companies coming up with, you try to get them to come up with an equal share. It, it But I, I would resign myself to the fact that you're never going to get before Zildjian bought Vic Firth, and, and they were for a long time a competitor. Um, you're never going to get Vic Firth to come up with an equal share that Zildjian's going to put in. Mm-hmm. And I accepted that after a while. It's like, you know what? 
and I, I got a lot of grief from my company for that. They'd say, look, you know, all these other companies have to put in an equal amount. This isn't right. But you know what? It, it is right because we're going to sell a set of symbols at, at a minimum. We're going to ask the dealer to buy Tony or Keith Carlock or somebody's symbol setup. They're going to spend X hundred dollars, even at their net cost. They're going to invest you know, a couple of thousand dollars retail and symbols. They're going to buy a Yamaha drum set or some kind of drum set. Um, so Zildjian and the drum company should spend more money on this. If they're going to buy a couple dozen pair of drumsticks and a couple dozen drum heads, then you can't expect Remo and Vic Firth to put in as much money. So people came around to that way of thinking. And in those days, the traveling was still fairly reasonable. And I'd get with it. I mean, I would do this all myself. I would get with a travel agent, but I'd sit down with the reps and I'd map out a tour and I'd say, we're going to start in Boston or we're going to start somewhere and work our way west. We'll finish at West LA Music or we'll finish at Pro Drum Shop in Hollywood and we'll hit eight or 10 stores along the way. We'll do like a, like a, um, you know, like a, a tour, like a bandwidth tour. We'll do three days on and one day off. Um, sometimes we do no days off. If I could get Dennis Chambers, Dennis would say to me, I've got 10 days in this period. And he's a good example, or Greg Bissonette. And those guys only got paid for the days they did clinics. And they would much rather work every day than have a day off. And if they're making a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks, they'd rather be, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a definitely, a, you're humping it when you're flying from place to place, getting up at five o'clock in the morning with a bag of symbols and a bag, and you're going through security, and then you're flying maybe an hour and a half to the next city and your rep picks you up and maybe you have time to go to the hotel and drop your stuff. But sometimes you go right to the store and you set up and it's four o'clock in the afternoon, four 30, you eat something quick. And then the clinics at seven, you know what I mean? And you, and you get done after having dinner with the dealer, it's 12 o'clock, go back to the hotel and you're up the next day at five or five 30. So, I mean, it's that kind of a thing. Um, but anyway, I, we would string it together with a travel agent so that it, you, it made the most sense travel-wise in terms of costs. And when you amortize the cost of, uh, it might be a couple of thousand bucks for the flight, but divide that by 10 stores, it's like 200 bucks a, a dealer. So it's not that expensive. Um, so you, you, it, it made sense financially in those days. And what started to change it, there were a few different factors. It was... Zildjian and, and drum companies and a lot of people basically saying, okay, from now on, the most we're going to spend on a clinic is X number of dollars. We're only going to spend $300 tops. And if, if Zildjian and DW or Zildjian and whatever drum company only spend that much or Sabian or anybody, um, and then the drum com the drumstick company and the head company pay $150, all of a sudden you're, you're never going to make the math work. You're never going to ask the deal. The dealer's never going to pick up that extra five or six hundred dollar difference, um, and that's what started to happen. And then couple that with the fact that I think consumers started to lose interest. I mean, you started to see, unless it's a really big name guy. If I was talking, you know, I was talking to Vinnie Colaiuta last week about a project that he's working on and a project that I'm working on, and you know, oftentimes. He, we used to talk about him going out and doing a, a, a clinic tour, but more of like a master class type thing with a small number of people that pay, you know, a good amount of money to see because it's Vinny. Um, and he was asking me, he's like, yeah, but you know, it seems like nobody even really wants to go to these things anymore. I said, there's only a handful of people and you're one of them. And I know that, 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 you know, you've created enough of a market by not doing them. That if you did decide, and I said, and I'm not trying to talk you into anything. Those days are gone. <laughs> but if if you ever were, you know, and it, so anyway, it's just one of the things that I've been doing is is looking at this idea of, of um, online clinics or online master classes and working with some people to do that and helping a few people. And I know that's that's definitely becoming a thing now. So yeah, it's like a pay per view kind of thing. You could just yeah. get into some, and if it's done right. Stuff. Yeah. So it, it's, um, but it's, 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 it's changed a lot. It really has changed a lot. That whole, um, kind of way that that whole system worked for a long time. It, it doesn't, I, I think that model 
probably doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it was it was a fun model while it lasted because we we had some you know I think it, it and I say that in in in, in, in from the standpoint of it being great for dealers. I mean, we used to, the dealer used to sell a lot of product if they did it right. Um, the artists always enjoyed it. They enjoyed being out on the road and meeting people and doing clinics and working. And, and it was always good for Zildjian to be driving these things, you know, to have myself or someone out there in a store meeting cons- consumers, you know, that, I mean, nothing tops the mission from GAD tours that we did. Oh yeah. And, that's... Yeah. Those, were, those were bus tours. We went out, and you know, for two or three weeks at a time with Steve, and it was a self-contained unit, and they were huge. You know, it was hundreds of people every night, and it was a real special thing. Okay, here we go. Wood tip or nylon tip? Oh, wood tip, all the way. Boston or Los Angeles? Boston's my home. L.A. a little while. Weckle or Cayuta? Oh man, that, I, I didn't I gotta, see that one. I'm I'm innocent on this one. All right, I got to go with Vinny only because he's my Italian brother, and we love cannolis. Good answer. Scullers or Regatta Bar? Uh, I'm going to lean toward Regatta Bar on that one. Nam, summer or winter? Oh, winter, hands down. Dogs or cats? Dogs. I have many cats, but I'm a dog guy. DW, collectors or workshop? Uh, um, He's hesitating. That yeah, says I, a lot. I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I don't really know the difference between the two. In, in my days, <laughs> it was just DW. Right. I'll, say, I'll say collectors. Gotcha. ESPN, love them or hate them? Uh, love them. Zildjian Myth. True or false, is there a special endorser stock? Technically, no. And I can elaborate or I can just leave it at that. Leave it at that. (laughs) I've been to the West and I think there is. To the West Coast? Uh, To the West. I've been to the Zildjian West before. I don't know if there's a bad sounding symbol in there. Well, that that is an endorser office only. So technically, but in Norwell, there is not a artist stock gotcha gotcha a's or k's a's good a's dealer pain in the ass quotient mom and pop stores or mega stores (laughs) you know the answer to that one (laughs) i I do don't say anything (laughs) pcs or max uh mac all the way snare drum metal or wood oh that's the hardest question yet um, I'm going to go with metal. Giving away tickets. Red Sox, Bruins, Celtics, or Pats? Uh, what I'd most easily give up? Yes. Bruins. Name a great recorded cymbal sound. Ah, oh, boy. Um, take five. What is your sleeper vintage drum kit? Uh, my, it has to be one, one answer only? One answer. One answer. Sleeper. Sleeper. Under my right. peacock, peacock Satin Flame Kit. Gretsch, oh. 72. Gotcha. What's your favorite drum set method book? Uh, Ted Reed's Syncopation. Good. Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard? I think we know the answer. Yeah. He's invested. All right. Boston Rock Act. Aerosmith or the band Boston? Aerosmith. Last question. You call Zildjian. You have to have someone there at the factory pick out a symbol for you. Whose ears do you trust? Oh, it would be Paul Francis. Yeah. Here at the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast, when we do interviews, it is very rare when we don't either A, know the person that we're going to interview, or have a friend that has put us in direct contact with someone uh, who's going to be on the show. 
but this is one of the first exceptions. I'm a huge Steely Dan fan, as a lot of our listeners are, and I was struck earlier this year that Donald Fagan was going to do a solo tour, and instead of getting some of the cast of regular characters to surround him in his backing band, he decided to pick up a very young band based out of Hudson Valley, New York. And the drummer in that band is a gentleman named Lee Falco. So just out of nowhere, I found this guy on social media and I hit him up and I said, I know you're going to be in Atlanta sometime. Why don't we get together, go out, have a little bit of barbecue, have a coffee, sit down and talk about drums. And he was all about it. So here are some highlights from our talk with Lee Falco. How did the gig with the Night Flyers happen? How did it come about? Yeah, uh, well, we, like I said, we had done some of the stuff with him at the barn, and there's also this benefit that happens once a year for Family of Woodstock, a charity in Woodstock. Uh, that's a Bob Dylan excuse me, Bob Dylan benefit. And uh, we were the house band at that the last two years and Donald came and played at. And uh, so we had played with him a dozen or so times around Woodstock and Connor had become pretty good friends with him. Connor uh, sat in with the Dukes of September at the Beacon Theater and had just stayed in touch with Donald. And at one point in uh, the winter, this past winter around December, uh, well, actually, even before that, Connor had mentioned something about doing a, a Donald residency at the barn, and it fell through. And then, you know, in the winter, he called and was like, yeah, you know, Donald wants to do a tour. And when he first suggested it, I, I didn't really believe it. So I just remember sort of being like, yeah, okay, well, that would be amazing, man. You know, like, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> you know, we'll see. And uh, and I went on a trip to India with my girlfriend uh not long after that phone call came and and then like while i was in in india uh donald sent a bunch of tunes for us to learn and so i was uh <laughs> you know in these in these like uh little hotel rooms in india with my headphones on trying to learn how to play the groove of green flower street and all these other songs <laughs> and uh <laughs> it's just funny it was sort of stressful the whole time i was there uh because I had this, you know, audition with Donald Fagan lingering over me this whole trip. But uh, it was still an amazing trip. I highly recommend traveling to India. All right. All right, so here we go. Question number one. Drumsticks, wood tip or nylon tip? Wood tip. PCs or Max? Max. In-ear monitors or wedges? Oh, uh, well, right now I'm liking the in-ears. We'll go with that. I'll go with that. Text messages or phone calls? Phone calls. Ooh, throwback, man. Dude, duh. I'm telling you. You should <laughs> learn from him. Oh, I, I've been paying attention, dude. <laughs> I know what he's going to... He's old school. We already know the answer to this next one, but let's go with it anyway. Vintage or new drums? Vintage. Snare drum. Wood or metal? <sighs> Wood. What is your favorite recording studio microphone? Flea 47. Up all night or up at the crack of dawn? Up all night. Elvin or Tony? Elvin. Drum heads, thick or thin? Thick. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Sports, love them or hate them? Love them. Part two of the question. Rangers or Islanders? Rangers. Name an underrated drummer. Uh, uh, Tony Mason. Ooh. What's your favorite TV show? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Got me. Uh, John Oliver. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brushes, wire or plastic? Wire. Knew that one. Barbecue, pork, beef, or chicken? Chicken. What are you better at, singing or drumming? Drumming. Favorite 
hobby to do outside of music? Uh, travel. Last and million dollar question. Nightfly, Comic Curiad, Morph the Cat, or Sunken Condos? Nightfly. You passed, sir. <laughs> That's Lee Falco, everybody. Yeah, that right. is Lee Falco. Thanks Man. for having me. As 2017 progressed, we continued to do more interviews with other great drummers and industry icons. But one thing that we had not done was interview an orchestral percussionist. So we went ahead and broke the mold and decided, hey, why not go straight to the top? In this interview, we spoke to longtime ASO, that's Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, principal percussionist Jack Bell. And he sat down with us for a two part interview where we spoke primarily about his performance career and his teaching career. And in this short ex- excerpt, we're going to hear him talk about his studies of rudimental drumming and how he interprets some of the different passages of the Wilcoxon 150 rudimental solos. And then, of course, he was not immune to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast Rorschach test. And the first thing I want to ask you to explain is in the 150 book, the 150 rudimental solos for the All-American Drummer, one of the things that's often misinterpreted is his notation of seven-stroke rolls as far as like he has two primary notations that he uses for a binary style uh, seven-stroke roll and a ternary style seven-stroke roll. And the binary is preceded with what looks like a, a rough or a, or a drag that's on there. Explain how he, if you know how he arrived at that and then how you interpret it. Okay. I don't know quite how he arrived at that particular notation. Uh, that was particular to him, uh-huh. what he was thinking. But I do know exactly how he meant for that to be played. There's right. only one way to play that notation. Mm-hmm. When you see, and I've got a pair of sticks here to be able to demonstrate it. I hope it'll come through on the microphone okay. I think it will. When you see the seven-stroke roll in the Wilcox and 150 solos, and it's preceded by two grace notes, what you're going to do is come in on, and let me think for one second, you're going to come in as though you were counting one and two, D and D, one. So you're going to come in on the D and D, and for the D, the and, and the D, going to the one, which is the cutoff note, you're going to double stroke each of those notes. So it sounds like this. One and two, D and a one. One and two, D and a one. Now I'll go a little bit faster. One and two, D and a one. One and two. One and two, D and a one and uh, 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 Whatever it would be in the solo. So you have that interpretation when you have the two grace notes preceding the seven stroke roll whatever the count would be it's always d and a one and one is the cutoff note to the seven stroke roll awesome and then let's talk about the one where there are no grace notes in front of it it's just actually an eighth note that's tied over to another note that comes after that for the finishing stroke and that would be like his triplet or ternary uh style interpretation right in all the wilcox and solos you must understand that the seven stroke roll that is treated as a 16th note triplet is the fastest figure in the entire Wilcoxon series. I think that's probably the fastest figure you have to play in all of standard rudimental drumming. And I'll show it to you and you'll, you'll see that it's faster than any other articulation you would make in any of the solos. Which is kind of ironical because you get in. I don't remember. I don't have the book now in front of me, but that seven-stroke roll is going to come up right away in the solos. Maybe the first ten solos. I'm sure it is in there someplace. Uh, the, the, both this binary and ternary kept happen in the second and third solos. Of that. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Thank really you. quick. Thank you for your expertise. If I saw the book, I'd recognize it right away. I used that book. I just didn't have that question memorized. So, if you see a seven-stroke roll without the two grace notes preceding it. That seven-stroke roll is actually a 16th note triplet on the and count 
preceding the next downbeat. That's going to sound like this. One and two. Handle it one. One and two. Handle it one. However fast it would be, it's that 16th note triplet starting on the left hand, ending on the right hand. Now, to play the seven stroke roll, you have to double all the notes that are played on the one o or sorry an o let because you're counting in the exact place it occurs in the measure one and two you're starting on the and count you start the and count that you're counting the triplet and you go and no let one that's the counting of a 16th note triplet again one and two and no let one i have to double the strokes of and no let so it's going to be one and two and two and all at one and two and all at one and all at one and all at one that makes it much faster than one and two d and a one and two d and a one that's the two grace notes in front let me play it right up to speed in context now so, uh, 16th notes one and two and two and two Sixteenth note triplets. One and two. And two. And two. First question. Easy one. What's your favorite percussion instrument to play? Snare drum. What is your favorite percussion instrument to teach? Snare drum. Drum, it, drum set. Well, okay. the drum set. All right. In the symphony, playing to the delayed backbeat, do you love it or hate it? I'm used to it. It doesn't really affect me. You're talking about Robert Shaw, perhaps. <laughs> yes. You can follow his elbows. You can follow his downbeat. You can watch his face. Or you can watch the concert master give a nod, or you can watch a conductor play where his baton passes the third button on his shirt, and everybody agreed that they'll play when that happens. You just know when to play. Jack, that whole last part of your of your answer doesn't count. We want the quick, <laughs> <laughs> the quick answer. We want the quick answer. It's okay. Either way. <laughs> okay. Percussion piece. Stockhausen Zyklus or Kraft's French Suite? Kraft's French Suite. I'm familiar with that. Okay. Dogs or cats? Oh, dogs. Absolutely. On drum set, matched grip or traditional grip? I'm very comfortable with both. I started beginner on matched grip, and then I let them evolve into the traditional grip, so I teach both. <laughs> okay. What's your favorite rudimental snare drum method book? Uh, the Wilcox 150 Solos. Great. What's your favorite jazz drummer? Uh, I go back to Joe Morello or uh -huh. Buddy Rich. I'm only supposed to name one. Just one. All right. Um uh, uh, Joe Morello. Okay. I love that sound. Sports. Do you love them or hate them? I don't watch them. That's a hate them. No, uh, I just don't watch them. I don't have time. I, don't have, I never turned on the TV anymore. Jack, what's the ideal amount of private students for you right now? A dozen. Okay. Lee Howard Stevens or Gordon Stout? Mm, Lee Howard Stevens. I brought him down as a clinician. I, I really liked him from that on. What's the most difficult rudiment for you to play? The flam pair diddle diddle. That's a tough one. You want to hear it? <laughs> Barbecue. <laughs> Beef, pork, or chicken? Sorry for the silence, folks. Uh, this is a tough one. This me. is the hardest one so Yeah, far. it's the hardest one. <laughs> Beef, pork, or chicken? Uh, I, uh, pork, I think, maybe. Okay. Tough one. On concert snare drum. Plastic drum head or an animal head, like a skin head? Plastic is so common. I have to go with plastic anymore. It's so hard to keep a calfskin head properly it's tuned. It's impossible. Yeah. Taking Cloyd Duff out of the equation, who's your favorite tippinist? I would have to go with Vic Firth, I think, of the uh, Boston Symphony. Gotcha. I like that better than Goodman. All right. Concert snare drum book, De La Cluse or Cerrone? I'd go with Cerrone. It's more manageable. <laughs> that's that's the best explanation I've ever heard. That is fantastic. 
You're a sailor for boats, speed boats or sailing? Absolutely a speed boat. All right. I've been on sailboats. You have to work so hard to get from point A to 15 feet B. Yeah. <laughs> uh, communication, phone calls or emails? Uh, I go for phone calls. I always, the quick, quick way. Okay. Double paradiddle or paradiddle diddle? Double paradiddle. Okay. And the last question. What's your favorite motorcycle? Oh, I've had nine of them. Uh, I guess I have to go with my history that I think I enjoyed. I gotta, gotta get, can't give two answers. I gotta give one answer. Give two. Go ahead. Right. We'll let you do two. My favorite two motorcycles was my 90cc Kawasaki that I did my first wheelie on and my 125 Honda that I rode just everywhere, everywhere for years. I, I love those two bikes. He's an <clears throat> import man. <laughs> The next interview that we're going to hear clips from is my chat with Aquarian artist rep Chris Brady. I've known Chris for a long time, and he is very, very, very well respected inside of the industry. Um, I don't know anyone that has a bad word to say about him. He really does a great job of sitting down and talking with us about how he got the job at Aquarian, what he does there, how the heads are made, and also just tips on... Uh, how to get an endorsement, what they're looking for, what's expected from you. And uh, he also talks about the importance of relationships with uh, dealers and musicians inside the industry and how technology has changed the business. It's one of the easiest interviews I had to do. It was really just a couple of buddies sitting down and chatting. So let's listen to Chris Brady. Tell everybody what you have to have to get an endorsement and how not to do it. In other words, how the incorrect way. You bet. And uh, um, yes, I will. I will get into that. I mean, basically, again, this is this comes back to that really having a good self awareness and a, and a and a realistic self assessment. Like when I was playing top 40 gigs and I was in my mid twenties, it never occurred to me, it would never have occurred to me to seek an endorsement. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, but now the landscape has changed for a variety of reasons due to the number of companies and the internet and the whole thing. And so now you have artists that you're taking in from broad spectrums of abilities and, and, musical environments. Um, but I think the first thing is really assess, am I really at the point now where I should be reaching out to a company? And then if you really feel you, you are at that point, then if you have connections with other drummers that are associated with the company that you want to be involved with, ask them about it and then ha maybe have them feel it out. Put in a good word for you. That goes a long, a long, long way good references and then if you're going to cold reach out to a company you're going to do a cold call basically make sure especially with the emails really cons you know, we're so into this social media where we've almost gone back to hieroglyphics where no everybody uses emojis we reverted back to hieroglyphics nobody even uses words so i would always say construct a sentence Construct the paragraph, put your thoughts together logically so that you have a professional approach to the company. I can't tell you how many e emails I get where there's no even a greeting or a salutation. No, like, hello, Aquarian, or hello, Chris, I got you. It's just like, how do I get endorsement? Not even how do I get an endorsement. How do I get endorsement? And endorsement is spelled with a C in there somewhere. <laughs> and I, I, to be quite honest with you, those emails I don't even entertain. Because in my, you know, the uh, and, and I know, you know, Ron or Roy would, would think the same thing. If you can't take the time, this isn't important enough to you to take the time to really 
state your case in a professional way, if you're, if you, you know, can send, if you, if you can only send a one sentence thing that's spelled wrong and there's no punctuation, then how do you expect the company to really want to go down that road and take you seriously? Here, here we go. Question number one. Wood tip or nylon tip? Wood tip. Nam show. Summer or winter? Winter. Clear or coated? Coated. What's your favorite rock band? Oh, man. Come on, man. <laughs> wow, I don't have one. Okay, I'm going to go cliche. We're going to go back in time. Zeppelin. In and Out Burger or Roscoe's House of Chicken and Waffles? Okay, this is going to sound bad too. I've never been to Roscoe's. Shame, oh. shame on you. Oh, I'm going to say, but I've been in and out many times. In and out. What's your favorite drumming method book? Oh, man. This is going to sound weird, but one that really opened up my playing opened up my mind to things that I was hearing and didn't know but because I could read I could see it then was that Rick Latham advanced funk studies that's a, I man, loved that thing that's a great choice man that's a classic that thing opened up my mind to that style of drumming you know you're talking to the 80s right mm-hmm. yeah and all that stuff and you're wondering wow what and then when I saw that on the page and I could practice it it just that that one, for some reason, I really gravitated towards. Cool. Snare drum, wood or metal? Metal. When tuning, tune by ear or use a drum dial or other tuning device? By ear and feel. All right. Now, here's your first nemesis question. Dodgers or angels? Well, I don't watch baseball at all, really, but... Since the angels are literally <laughs> five minutes from us, I'm going to say angels. See, now you're, 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 I know where this next question is going to go. I was going to go kings or ducks. I'm just going to go ahead and put down ducks. <laughs> yeah, go for it. You're right, because they're at the Honda Center down there. Too. All right. New drums or vintage drums? Um, yeah, I know you just want a one-word answer. I, I don't know. New drums. PC or Mac? I don't own any Mac stuff, so PC. You will be happy to know that you're the first person who has said that, but yet I am recording on a PC, so you win. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> well, see, for the creative world, generally, right, artists, musicians and stuff, but, you know, all we use here, you know, we're all using PCs every day. So, uh, for me, PC, and I have an Android phone. I love it. So, yeah, PC. Ben, we are we are kindred spirits because I am the same thing. I have an Android phone as well. So There you go. Yeah. See? All right. Ralph's or Safeway? Uh, Ralph's. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Match grip or traditional grip? Started out traditional, but... Played match forever, so I'll just say matched. Elvin or Tony? Tony. Beach or mountains? Mountains. Soft bags or hard cases? Soft bags. What's your favorite TV show? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, you know, I've been watching recently... Uh, Walking Dead and Gotham. Walking Dead shot right here in town in Atlanta. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. All Ooh. right. Now here's the million dollar question. Yeah. When Aquarian is referred to with ambassador or emperor weights, do you just nod with acceptance or do you want to like choke that person out? <laughs> I go Brazilian jiu-jitsu and put it in naked choke. No, uh, I actually, you're going to laugh, but I use those terms a lot myself because it's a frame of reference 
it's a reference point that especially you know well any age drummer it's a good jumping off point where people understand because we we know that we have a lot of different lines and other companies do too so if you say you know well i'm looking for this single ply you mean like an ambassador weight and they'll go yeah and i'll say well that's our texture coated head well i i really love a two ply head and i say you mean like an emperor weight and they go yeah yeah well that would be our response too so i don't there's nothing wrong with that it's a good universal place that we can leap off from so that i can help people get you know the head they're looking for so it's not offensive then i know yeah Here at Drummers Weekly Groovecast, we make no bones about saying that one of our favorite drummers is Tom Brechtline. Uh, He's been talked about on the show several times, been featured in one of our segments as an underrated drummer, and in my opinion, one of the most underrated drummers. This guy has got a resume and um, just a musical background that just knocks you out. Just a tremendous player and a super nice guy. And so when we had the opportunity to sit down with Tom, it was an absolute no-brainer. So we're going to play a couple of clips now from our interview with Tom Brechtline. In a previous interview, you mentioned an interesting concept that I'd like for you to elaborate on a little bit. You mentioned that during either just jamming with Chick or in rehearsals, he started talking to you about a concept he called the Grand Pulse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's an old, I mean, I've recently come back to it. It's sort of like, instead of, of course you need to subdivide, you know, for time reasons and stuff like that. Mm Mm-hmm. But I think what he was trying to convey, well, convey about the time, but I think once you have the subdivisions down, then try and go the other way, like half notes or whole notes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Sure, absolutely. The first whole note is one, the second whole note is two, you know. I kind of heard Jack DeJeanette do that one night, at one time in a recording, and it finally brought that thing, that thing back to me, which was uh, on the stand, I think it was standards two or maybe standards one. They were playing Stella by Starlight, and he was playing Brushes. And I remember uh, uh, I just came back from a gig, and the keyboard player, really great key- piano player, Kei Akagi, we were coming back from a gig, and we hung at his house for a minute. And he goes, check this out. And I go, oh, man, I, don't think, I think I'm music dad. I really don't want to listen to any music. So he put Stella by Starlight on, and Jack Dijonette was playing Brushes on it, beautifully, I might add. But, you know, there wasn't, of course, there wasn't two and four or any kind of subdivision. He was just playing phrases. Mm-hmm. And I realized I came to this, this, I guess, epiphany. Oh, my God. I said, the changes, it has, I guess it has something to do with, along the lines of Grand Pulse, I guess. Um, he's playing the changes as a beat. Like the first change, da, 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 this beat one, da, 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 two. Three, four, five, whatever you want to right. subdivide. But the re- but he was, he was, it was just he was gliding and playing so musically. Of course, he's also a piano player, so that has a lot to do with it too. But um, it was just to me. Maybe other guys knew about it, but it was at the time I went, oh yeah, at least I got it. You know, everybody gets something when they're ready to get it. All right, here we go. Snare drum, wood or metal? Yikes. Metal. When you're reading charts, do you like them overwritten or just the basics, sir? Oh, shit. In the middle. <laughs> All right. <laughs> drum heads, clear or, basic, so clear or coded? Basic, but in the middle. Okay. Drum heads, clear or coded? Coded. In ear monitors or wedges? Ooh, that's tough. That's tough. Wedges. New York or LA? New York. (laughs) 
Elvin or Tony? Oh, man. <laughs> You're a jerk. Elvin. <laughs> but, you know. No caveats, Tom. You, you, you're you in with Elvin. What, I know. Elvin's funky. What What's your favorite symbol right now? Uh, my favorite? HHX Extreme. When you're touring. Crash. Gotcha. When you're touring, buses or planes? Buses. Now he sings, now he sobs, or three quartets? Now he sings, now he sobs. Barbecue, pork, beef, or chicken? Yeah, shit. Beef. PC or Mac? Mac. <laughs> Floor toms on legs or mounted? Legs. What's your favorite TV show? Whoa! Oh, God. Game of Thrones. Green room catering. Do you eat the food or break out that per diem? Break out the per diem. <laughs> What's your favorite vintage drum kit? Oh, uh, Rogers Free CPS. Ooh, that's nice, man. Yeah. Yeah, Blue Meta Hardware. Coffee or tea? Coffee. What is your most valuable method book? You only got one. Oh, Joe Casadas. The Joe Casadas book I was talking about. What's your favorite hobby? Rhythmic Patterns. Joe Rhythmic Patterns. Gotcha. Yes. What's your favorite hobby unrelated to music? Oh, unrelated to music. I don't think I have any hobbies unrelated to music. Oh, uh, uh, learning learning accents. <laughs> okay. Like German. German, doing accents. That's my favorite. Hobby. Nice. What's the most difficult rudiment for you to play? Oh, jeez. Difficult rudiment. Oh, I know everything, don't I? Um, holy Christmas. I never thought about that. I would say the standard flam paradiddle. Got it. Right, left, right, right. Last question. Name any recording that you wish you had played on. Ooh. Oi, Vespier. Recording I wish I could could have played on. Oh man. I wish I could have played on a recording with John Schofield. You talking about a tune? The full album. Is there an album of Schofields that you wish you would have played on? Gosh. Damn. How about um even though I could never play like Adam Dyke, who I'm a fan of, Uber Jam. Oh, yeah. Now, you better qualify that because it's Adam. Adam's the cat on that record. Yes, he I is. I could never duplicate what he did on that, but I just would love to play with John Schofield. That's just, that's the, uh, that's the thing. How's that? Awesome, Tom. You passed the test, man. You passed the buster. One of the most unique drummers in the history of recorded music is our next guest, Rock Alam Bob Moses. However, he does share a lot of the same similarities that we like to talk about with some of our other guests in relation to this show. He's been talked about several times on the show. We've referred not only to his playing, but about that seminal book that he put out in the 80s called Drum Wisdom. Still consider it to be one of the greatest books um, for drummers that's ever been put out. Uh, and then also we've had several of our guests that have mentioned uh, Bob. If you go back and, and listen to uh, the Tom Brechtline uh, interview in particular, he really has some very nice things to say about Bob with his interactions with him. All right, let's go ahead and give a listen to some of the Bob Moses interview. And let me once again throw out uh, the caveat that there were some pretty serious audio issues on this show. We did the best that we could to remove a very loud ground hum from Bob's voice. Uh, so 
Be patient with us and give a listen to Bob Moses. You were on Matheny's Bright Size Life album, which for, I would say, probably half of our listening audience, that's probably where they're the most familiar with you with is that first record. So kind of how did that come about? Do you have fond memories of that? Well, uh, I, you know, I was with Gary Burton three three different times. Yeah. And the one of them was like kind of around the 60, 67, 68, 69 maybe. Uh, then again, around 74, it was a different band. And of course, we had uh, Matheny, also Mick Goodrick was two guitar. Mm -hmm. Matheny, Matheny mostly played 12 string, I think, with Gary's band at that point. And uh, Steve Swallow was in that band. Yeah, I could, I, you know, I, I, I thought Matheny was a super gifted kid uh, at the time. And uh, we, we, you know, I, I was happy that he, he liked playing with me and, and he brought Jocko, he knew Jocko, the bass player from uh, Florida. I think he maybe had gone to the University of Miami briefly or something. And met Jocko, so he brought Jocko up to play, and Jocko blew me away. I mean, this guy was wow, uh, quite a thrill to play with him. And so, of course, I enjoyed. I enjoyed the live gigs maybe more than the recording experience for a lot of reasons. Uh, yeah, I wasn't a big fan of the ECM style particularly, although I. They've certainly made some great records, you know, and uh, kind of the vibe uh, and how it affected the music. But um, yeah, so I don't know about the, I don't know if the recording itself was uh, 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 such a positive experience, but but playing with Matheny and Jocko, uh, we did we did a bunch of gigs one summer. It was small gigs. We played at a place called Pooh's Pub. Played another place in Somerville. Really small joints um, trio. And, and that was that was fun, but I, you know, but I, again, I was coming from a very different place, and uh, and certainly than Matheny, um, and and uh, uh, even though uh, I was only slightly older, but my experience was more with black musicians, people like Max Rose, Eric Dolphy, Coltrane, Pharaoh. That was what I was into, but I wasn't getting gigs with people like that because those people don't, had almost all black drummers, and, and why not? You know? Um, so I would get gigs with some of the best white guys like Gary Bird and Pat Feeney and Jocko who really was as, as soulful as anybody with skin color aside you know, it's not about skin it's about your soul really but uh, uh, Jocko had some force but even him and Matheny were very different personalities and a lot of times I was kind of the referee yeah. between, between the two of them I could see both points of view uh, Pat is a little bit of a control freak, and he's a natural leader. He's a great composer. He knows what he wants his band to be, and he knows what he's trying to put out. And Jocko was like a wild horse, you know. Uh, uh, and Jocko played his music, though, great. And in the early days, Matini's tunes were like four pages long. There's thousands of chords. And Jocko's thing was just give me an E. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to funk out an E, and that's all he needed. And so the music wasn't really letting Jocko kind of do his thing. And he was coming all the way up from Florida, taking a bus, Greyhound bus, sleeping on the couch for a $50 gig, $100 gig. And um, yeah, if it was me, I'd have made it more like an equal trio and let everybody have their thing. But Pat, you know, he's a, like I say, he's a natural leader. That's, what, that's, that's how he's a composer. And so eventually, uh, Jocko would start to bogart a little bit. He would start throwing in some funk. And then also, when he would do that, the audience would go crazy. They'd start yelling, Jocko, Jocko. And I, I don't think Madini liked that too much because it was his band. And so there were a little bit of conflict. So. But still great, still great to play with them. How would you tell our listeners the concept of organic drumming? Well, organic drumming just means that which can't be transcribed. It's like nature. It's like a cloud. It's like the ocean. You know, it's like a, a rock slide. It's like an avalanche. It's like a, a bubbling, babbling brook. And it's, you know, you can't write those rhythms. If you could, who could, who would, who could read it? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. uh, but the point is that... Um, you know, people like Elvin and Jack DeJanette, 
uh, are very organic drummers. Um, and and if you and if you're still dealing with time and form, you can bring the organic, or another way to say it's the cosmic, really, into your form. You have to have a strong. That the form has to be really strong in, internally, and then you can do that. Um, so, for example, if we're talking about resolution point, the eight eight. Let's well, I just said and the four, so let's stay on and the four. Mm-hmm. If you have if you have two bars of eighth note with a pulse, very clear in your mind. Let's say. After a while, you can say. That's bringing the organic into uh, into form. Then, of course, the way I play now, I'm not even dealing with form. It's all pretty much all organic, you know, because I'm not even worried about eight notes or resolutions too much. Uh, I like to play from rubato. That's been my evolution. But um, that, but you can play organic. You can bring the organic into your forms, and uh, if you have, if your form is strong, and you and you don't get, and you won't get lost. But I always warn people: don't worry, I won't do that on your game. Don't be afraid. <laughs> If you listen to the Mike Johnston podcast, which was just posted a few weeks ago, if you were not aware of why this guy is as successful as he is, by the time you finish that podcast, it was glaringly apparent. There's probably no better communicator right now, especially for online content, than Mike Johnston. And the amount of subscribers that he has to mikeslessons.com is certainly a testament to that. I had an absolute blast with Mike. I mean, we hit it off from the very beginning all the way through the end, and I think it's apparent when you listen to the show. So let's check out a couple of clips from my sit-down with Mike Johnston. Why don't you tell our listeners, what is a typical day like in your (laughs) life? Well, it starts with my dogs waking me up and licking my palms. I have no idea what it's all about, but (laughs) they're like, that's my alarm every day at about 645 in the morning. My dogs like nuzzle their way back onto the bed and they just lick my hands until I wake up. So that's how it starts. And then, uh, I mean, I usually get to work. Uh, I'd say probably about 8.30 in the morning. And then if it's a live lesson day where we do our live broadcast lessons or streaming lessons, then I'm doing the PDFs for that. I'm downloading the student videos that I'm going to review. I'm kind of watching those. And pretty much everything is based around the live lesson until noon, which is when it happens, uh, Pacific Standard Time. And then from that point on, it's just filming content and editing content. And then there's just days where I can't do any of that stuff, but it's still all drum based because maybe I'm doing an interview like this, or maybe I'm doing some, some educational content for a magazine in a different country. So there's just a lot. I would say I film videos every day. I teach live online, uh, every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then I try at some point to squeeze in some practice because I have drum festivals and drum clinics coming up and I want to get better at the drums. I mean, if I'm not a good example of drumming, then my business will fail. So I need to get better. Here we go. Question number one. Gretsch Drums, USA customer broadcaster. Broadcaster. What's your favorite method book? Practical Applications by Kim Plainfield. Do you rise with the sun or up at the crack of noon? By the way, Practical Applications is by Chuck Silverman. I meant uh, Advanced Concepts by Kim Kim Plainfield. I rise with the sun. You can't go back, man. You're ruining the groove here. I said the wrong thing. I'm sorry. (laughs) I can't. I'm an educator. I I, I feel like when I get to heaven, Chuck Silverman's going to punch me in the face. (laughs) All right. So we got rise with the sun. All right. Moving on. Snare drums, wood or metal? Metal. 
Benny Greb or Jojo Mayer? Benny Mayer. Benny Greb. <laughs> What's your favorite TV show right now? Uh, Walking Dead. Shot in Atlanta. Thank you very much. Nice. Pat Boone, Debbie Boone, or Face Melter? Oh, Pat Boone, Debbie Boone. Clear batter head or coated batter head? Coated. Sports, love them or hate them? Love them. Now we move into the rudimental section of our quiz. Double paradiddle or paradiddle diddle? Paradiddle diddle. Flam accent or Swiss triplet? Swiss triplet. Flam paradiddle or flammed mill? Flammed mill. Man, we're brothers. What's the most difficult rudiment for you to play? Ooh, let's go with the the book report. I wouldn't say it's the most difficult rudiment for me to play, but it's the difficult, most difficult rudiment for me to use. Gotcha. You went hybrid on us, man. I did. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Tea. You just landed your dream playing gig. Who's the mm. first person you call? Mmm. Joe Arrington from the band A Lot Like Birds. I'm going to make sure I tell Amber that. Uh, <laughs> when you're playing live, do you like to play to a click or nothing? Nothing. PC or Mac? PC. Woo, man, You, me and you are the only ones. Yeah, uh, baby. What's your favorite hobby outside of music? Oh, man. Floating in a float tank. Good stuff. Text messages or phone calls? Uh, depends on the person. I'll, I'll go with text for now. All right. Million dollar question. There's a small room in your house. It's on fire. Inside that room are all your cameras and all of your watches. Oh, oh you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah. do you, what do you run in and get and don't say all the cameras all the watches you got one camera or one watch why do you take i'm taking my canon c100 with a 24 millimeter lens attached to it congratulations sir you did not freeze to death like jack nicholson in the maze sweet chicken gumbo thanks so much for joining us on this 2017 retrospective uh, we really enjoyed putting together some clips of our favorite moments from some of our favorite interviews of 2017. Moving forward in 2018, we already have a few new interviews on the docket, as well as some great topics and great segments coming for you in the new year as well. With that in mind, I want to make sure that I remind everyone that on the first and third Thursdays of every month, we are starting a new mini episode. We're calling it Accountability Thursday. On those mini episodes, we're going to take some solos from the NARD book, some of the Wilcoxon books. We're going to hash those things out. We're going to practice together, learn a little bit, and have some fun. If you want full details, there's uh, the official announcement on the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast homepage that you can find in iTunes, Google Play Podcast, Stitcher, Podbean, anywhere that you listen to your favorite podcast. You can also find information about Accountability Thursday and the rest of the show on our social media. You can go to Facebook. We're at facebook.com forward slash Drummers Weekly Groovecast. You can also tweet us. We are at twitter.com forward slash DW Groovecast. And if you want to email us, you can always use our traditional email address. We are at drummersweeklygroovecast at gmail.com. All right, that's going to do it for this week. On behalf of John, this is Phil, and we'll see you next Monday. <laughs>